Um, my talk today, as mentioned, is called The Money Disappears at Midnight, and it's based on my research, which is going on in Indonesia at the moment. So, the story begins in 2018 with uh, my former classic. He spent a month in his village, which is in central Java in Indonesia. His younger brother had recently passed away, and Asif had returned to help with the funeral arrangements and to be with his family. Back in Jogja, where my fieldwork took place, Asif turned on the ride sharing app platform that he was using as an online driver, only to find that he was no longer receiving orders. After hours of driving around and waiting, he finally called customer service, um, who promptly told him that the system was working just fine and that there was nothing wrong with his account. Silakan, please carry on. 20 days later, with expenses for food, fuel, and car rental piling up and still few orders, Asif decided to cut his losses and sell his account, taking advantage of the fact that driver registrations had closed earlier that year. It wasn't worth much, less than 85 US dollars, and less than half the price of a good account. <laughs> Aside from its current inability to receive orders, the account was also registered in his dead brother's name, which made it impossible to change the affiliated bank account. The buyer would have to take over the ATM card in order to extract his digital earnings. Months later, Asif recounted to me, the buyer had gotten in touch with him to let him know that he had managed to fully resuscitate the account, meaning it was finally receiving orders again. The buyer had given the account therapy, meaning <laughs> he had gradually sort of nursed it back to health. Account therapy is the term used by drivers to describe a variety of practices deployed to train the algorithms that govern the distribution of orders um, within the platform. So therapy is a form of intervention, but it's also a continuing practice since maintaining the vitality of your account becomes a necessary part of the job when your job is governed algorithmically. The platform that ASIC and many others relied upon comes from the Indonesian unicorn Gojek. The app provides users with access to a wide variety of services, ranging from go car, to go food, to go massage. The app was built with an uh, inbuilt digital wallet um, called GoPay, which can be topped up using cash with designated agents, and which facilitates digital payments from service users to service providers within the platform. Currently, neither bank account nor formal ID are necessary for service users, though they do give access to additional features such as sending money to friends or cashing out. Gojek and many platforms like it are often referred to as peer-to-peer -peer services, infrastructures for cashless money exchange. Researchers Stephen Ria and Taylor Nelms from the Institute of Money, Technology, and Financial Inclusion at UC Irvine describe P2P as a very additive of mobile payments, the fundamental transactional form, two actors, two nodes, and a technical network between them. Originating as a technical term, the acronym has gained wide traction and is now used to describe a wide variety of socioeconomic activity, remittances, lending, cryptocurrency, and a wide variety of commercial digital wallets um, relying on proprietary infrastructure governed, in fact, by central intermediaries. We tend to think of digital money as an evolution of cash. In reality, digital money is a data point controlled by your bank and digital payment is really a request that an intermediary edit their record of, the, of that data. And so, as anthropologist Brett Scott points out, rather than thinking of digital money as an evolution on cash, we can think of it as an evolution on accounting. Mm -hmm. While there are certainly benefits to the digital accounting of money, there are also numerous challenges. Increasing surveillance, risks of theft, and of course, increased gatekeeping and financial exclusion. Buying drinks is more practical using e-money, the vending machine at Gajamada University claims. Though of course it isn't, if you haven't got any. <laughs> In developing decentralized and disintermediated uh, payments, it is necessary to investigate how such innovations would interface with existing technology and the social infrastructures of payments. And it is necessary to consider whether such solutions might contribute to further dispossession, disenfranchisement, and dependency. The Indonesian Digital Payment Act bridge an important infrastructural gap in Indonesia. Fragmented infrastructures for connectivity and deregulation of the telecommunications industry have resulted in the widespread use of mobile phones, which pr prove both more convenient and affordable um, than traditional landlines. 
Nevertheless, surveys show that less than half the population has access to smartphones, which is significant given that an estimated 80% of Indian internet users are accessing it through their devices. What that entails is also worth considering. Sorry. Um, yeah, so data packages for smartphones frequently have pre-allocated or free gigabytes for social media, for example. For many, social media may be the only interface with the internet, and studies found that many users of services, such as Facebook, do so without realizing they're using the internet. And while my research takes place in an urban setting where public Wi-Fi feels ubiquitous, it is important to point out that quality of access is not evenly distributed across Indonesia. While statistics show growing access to smartphones, many are of low, very low quality, and have very limited storage space. So several of my informants um, reiterated the importance and value of social media in their daily lives, explaining that they would rather prioritize apps such as Instagram and WhatsApp than having multiple apps for digital payments. Fragmentation and lacking interoperability are also characteristic of infrastructures for payments, more broadly. In a supermarket, seven card readers greet the customers, one for each bank, and two for app-based payments, just to make things really easy. <laughs> An entire metal tree of shelves has been created to support the infrastructure. Given that less than half of Indonesians have access to formal financial services, and in 2016, only an estimated 11% of these had access to a debit card, this picture already represents payments for a minority of the population. Thus, the emerging digital payment apps provide a proxy banking service, a sort of banking light. You can, also, you can use cash to top up your digital account, upgrade for more features, and use the digital credit with designated merchants. 2019 saw a rapid proliferation of such apps. Aggressive competition for customers <laughs> made paying with an app a much cheaper option and made luxuries such as Pizza Hut or cinema tickets more affordable for many users. In fact, in interviews, many users emphasize these cashbacks as the main value of payment apps, perceiving them as a discount mechanism rather than a valuable tool for financial exchange. Conversely, one afternoon, as an older driver complained to me, it's becoming too expensive for his customers to use cash, due to what he referred to as fees on cash, cash payments. While there are yet no direct pay fees for paying with cash, there is an indirect penalty as users miss out on the digital discounts. The app interface itself heavily reinforces this feeling through features such as red pop-ups and by showing the price difference in large bold letters, thus emphasizing the cost of cash. In effect, it is the people who can afford to participate and maintain digital accounts that are able to reap the economic benefits. Given the increasing use of the term P2P, including transactions on the blockchain. I think it's critical to think beyond users and to understand the ways in which those apps are configuring relationships between these peers. In a social context, the word peer is used to describe two people with socioeconomic equality. Um, and in a social context, oh sorry, when we hear it used in the context of payments, we instinctively make a positive association. Except, in a socioeconomic context, there are always intermediaries that facilitate the exchange between the peers. And for the most part, the, uh, the responsibilities of these intermediaries are obfuscated behind the integer of the two. When I asked online drivers in Indonesia about their relationship to the company, the two, they refer to themselves as Mitra. We are partners. Mitra is the word that the apps use to describe drivers. However, during one focus group interview, another driver observing us interjected <coughs> by saying, but we have never met. The afterthought, eventually voiced by most drivers, emphasized that the relationship between driver and intermediary is not, in fact, an equal partnership. For the company, it is transactions made by the customer that are profitable, and thus drivers are tools to provide the customers with these services. One mechanism deployed by the company to optimize a service for its customers is the driver incentive scheme. Drivers earn a set fee per kilometer and that the app calculates for a trip, called a tariff. Many drivers frequently point out that the companies set the tariff artificially low in order to attract customers. To compensate and to incentivize the drivers to work as much as possible, drivers can earn bonus points according to a three-tiered schema. Each tier represents a set amount of rupiah, which is credited to the driver's wallet at the end of the day, though only if the drivers have a certain completion rate for drives, of course. Um, Drivers earn points for each completed trip, as well as by selling their digital credit to customers in exchange for cash. 
For drivers, these bonuses are an essential part of their income, without which this work would not be sustainable. Thus, like account therapy, point chasing becomes a critical part of the job. And therefore, for drivers, there's an equivalence between hard-earned points and money. However, one point shy of the next tier level where the app resets, and the points are forfeited. In practice, they explained, the money disappears at midnight if you have failed to materialize it. The transition to digital money raises questions of who owns what, when. Drivers had also experienced being locked out from their digital accounts if they were suspended due to, for example, a negative rating. Once again, encounters with customer service proving a poor replacement for due process or impartial arbitration. I encountered, oh, I encountered many acts of resistance towards the rigid parameters imposed by such apps, referred to by my informants as the act of monopoly, or outsmarting the system. Drivers giving their accounts therapy in order to train the algorithms governing order distributions, using ghost apps to conceal and reclaim GPS data, semi-formal third-party account renders, such as in this picture, passengers and drivers conspiring to avoid the 20% company cut of the profit, people sharing accounts, pins, and smartphones, all strategies to make surviving with proprietary platforms viable by maintaining flexibility within imposed digital rigidity. On the surface, digital transactions seem streamlined and clean, the messiness of cash exchanges replaced and confined to the affordances of the user interface, and the terms and conditions set by the companies providing the platform. However, the exchange of digital money is about far more than the financial transaction and contains much more that can be summarized in an elegant acronym. This raises questions about how all of that inherent messiness will fit into seamless ideas about immutable ledgers, disintermediation, and trustlessness. And with that, I give it over to the conference.